There's a myth of genius. There's a myth of inspiration. There's lots of revising and redoing. All of that, plus all of the waiting until you have the opportunity to do it while you're working at a job you don't like, all plays into the eventual product. One informs the other as long as we don't make a separation between art and life. Welcome. I'm Doug Casina. I'm an artist, a gallerist, a curator, and a collector. And this is Artbound, where we deconstruct the myths and misconceptions of the art world. We have the conversations here with artists that aren't going to be found anywhere else. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We have a really interesting topic that I'm excited to dive into. Um, joining us today is Monique Krein from her studio in Denver, Colorado. Hi, Monique. Hey, Doug. Monique is an artist who received her BA from San Francisco State, her MFA from Cornell University, and has taught at Harvard for seven years. She's also done uh, residencies at the La Napoule Foundation in France. And she tells me that she's been painting a lot of dogs lately uh, during the pandemic. Uh, one of her more major recent exhibitions was at a solo show at the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, in Denver, Colorado. Um, I also have with us uh, Kuzana Og, uh, who is joining us from her studio in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hi, Kuzana. Hi, Doug. Hi, Monique. Kuzana was born in Bombay, and then she moved to England and later the United States, and is currently in residence at El Zagun, a historic building in Santa Fe uh, on Canyon Road there. Uh, she has participated in residencies in Minnesota, Sri Lanka, China, Scotland, Latvia, and most recently in Iceland this February. Her work has appeared in a lot of different film and TV episodes, uh, and it, you can find it in uh, embassies in Latvia, Brazil, and Ghana, including national and international collections. And she's had two solo museum shows in the last five years. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us uh, to talk about art during a pandemic and how we go through this balancing act of life and art. So first off, um, let's kind of test this thesis that we've come up with. Um, are art and life at odds with each other? Monique is also joining us right now uh, with her baby Noah, and we I believe this is Noah's first podcast. It is. It is. Seacrest asked him to join last week, but we had to turn him down. Casina first. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> oh, by the way, I represent Monique at K Contemporary, so that might be part of why I get first shot at Noah as well. That's true. <laughs> so, Monique, do you think that art and life are at odds with each other in some way? You know, I, I actually don't. Um, and having two kids now under two... I find so much creativity is expressed in just the day to day of having these two like new little minds growing up around me. So I, I don't see, I, I mean, I'm not making, uh, you know, 14 by 10 foot paintings right now, but <laughs> in everything we do together as a family, there's, there's so much creativity um, that it, it at least nurtures that artistic bone for me. I totally feel the same way. For me, I look at what I do as an artist, as a gallerist, you know, as a curator, even this podcast, it's it's almost like a lifestyle choice. You know, I don't see art as a job or a career necessarily that you can almost separate from your life. And I think that's what we're kind of getting at uh, the topic of this podcast is there's some point where we either consciously or unconsciously shape our life around our creative process or our creative process gets shaped around our life. 
Uh, Kuzana, I know that this even comes up in like your living situation and where you're physically at all the time, uh, be it you know at your residency program that you're at in Santa Fe or when you're traveling around the world. Could you talk a little bit about how that lifestyle either affects your art or how your art affects that lifestyle? Yes. So I also agree with both of you that um, the whole process of living is a series of opportunities to collect experiences that can then be distilled into whatever the art form is. So for me, um, when I look at spaces, for example, like when buying a house I'm really only interested in the studio and everything else is secondary. So it can have a miniature kitchen, a teeny tiny living room, but as long as the studio is beautiful, it doesn't even have to be large. It just has to be beautiful in terms of light and materials, um, then I'm content. And so where we're living right now is a very teeny tiny little space with um, beautiful studio in a historic building and uh, everything else goes on in one other tiny room. So the other tiny room is kitchen, living room, bedroom. I'm totally going to read between the lines there because, you know, your statement was if you're looking for a house, you look at the studio first and that's what's important and the rest is all secondary. And do you feel like that's the same translation with where art appears in your life? Yes. The studio is where the, where the life is distilled into visual imagery. So that's where the meditation goes on. That's where the thinking process goes on. Planning for the rest of life all happens in that studio while paintings also happen. Well, and I also was noticing that you were talking about experiences that you're having as life being activators for your artwork. And I, I re that really resonated with me because I've been looking at this idea of what art is as a trigger for an experience. So it's almost like the art becomes the opposite where we're inviting somebody to have that experience, whereas your experiences are the things that then feed your art. Yes. Do you feel like, Monique, that you have had your life interrupting your creative work? Um, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in terms of my like professional artistic career. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's especially with the pandemic um, before we had the luxury of putting at least the first kiddo. I just had this one, Noah, uh, seven weeks ago, but with the first kiddo, we were able to, you know, put him into daycare or have a nanny. Um, and I was able to continue my practice uninterrupted, minus, you know, working into the wee hours of the morning. But now with the pandemic, uh, for the safety of our family, we have everybody home. So I'm only able to produce very, very, very small paintings. And a lot of them are frankly of dogs lately because they're joyful. They make people happy. They make me happy. Um, and they're easier to produce in a short period of time or in my limited studio hours, or I should say studio minutes. Studio minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and sometimes that's all you need is like these frenetic bursts of time to like yeah. kind of start that process. Yeah. Uh, Monique, how has uh, your postpartum experiences shaped your art life and the kind of uh, your, from your studio practice to your exhibition practice? Well, as, as you know, we postponed one show because the very act of having a baby and just the responsibilities thereafter were, were frankly more than I had anticipated. Yeah. Everything was really great at first and I thought I could tackle the world, but then uh, infants become toddlers and you know, you go from breastfeeding to not breastfeeding. And there's so many ups and downs that I, I think I wasn't fully aware of the volume of responsibility, um, emotionally, spiritually, physically, um, that a kiddo required. 
Um, but I've been fortunate to have a, a community of individuals, especially in the art community, who have supported me and have uh, allowed me the the freedom to not be present, um, hmm. which has been great, frankly. You know, you were talking about how you're recognizing the way that you're interacting with your kiddos as part of this expression of your creativity. How do you see that creativity informing art uh, moving forward from here? Do you think it's going to have a, a fairly sizable impact on the way that you approach your art? I would imagine so. Um, I find my work is so much more joyful uh, now than it was before. I started doing dog paintings, I would say... God, it's been like four years now, maybe five. And a lot of that was in reaction to a uh, family tragedy. Um, my sister asked me to paint dogs for her baby, and I was happy to do that. Um, but I continued doing it because we had some very painful experiences within our family. And the dogs just brought everybody so much joy. It was really nice getting that reaction as opposed to the sad ladies <laughs> that I had painted before. Um so I'd, I'd imagine even now when I look to create work, the images I'm more attracted to are ones that are a bit more positive than what I'm traditionally known to paint. So, Kuzana, I know that uh, because of your living situation, because of your travel, uh, you're also married. And how do you use that, you know, that shaping your life around your artistic practice? How has that, uh, you know, affected that relationship or, or does it? I don't think it does because I happen to be married to somebody who's very flexible in terms of just letting me be in my studio and uh, traveling whenever I want to. So um, I've traveled a lot as a child internationally and nationally once we came to America. I like traveling because it's a glimpse often based on my own interpretation into somebody else's life. Well, so is that what you do when you're at residencies? Like, is a lot of it engaging with people, uh, you know, in the place that you're at and overhearing their lives? And does that then inform your, the way that you're approaching your studio practice? Yes, absolutely. So I'm very isolated here in Santa Fe and 95% of it is because I want it that way. Um, I want to just do my work. And so I spend 14 or so hours per day in studio. When that becomes too much, that's when I like to travel. And that's when I'm ready to see other people and hear about their lives and look at their architecture and see how their houses are reflected in their personalities or how the weather shows up in their language so it's a it's a period of collecting information after having a long time to process other information. So it's putting information in when I travel and taking it out when I paint. I'm I'm so curious if you don't mind me going back, Kazana. You know, you had mentioned that you do these residencies around the world, and so much of that is a part of your practice and a part of your inspiration. And you know, over the last nine months, I would imagine you haven't been able to travel. So I'm curious how that's affected your productivity and your inspiration. Yes. So I did actually receive a residency in Iceland in February of this year. And I went and I came back right on March 1st or 2nd. And then the whole COVID thing blossomed. So for the last uh, several months, I have been making paintings that have to do with Iceland and snow and traveling there. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you noticed that the palette of your paintings, because they're so, so rich and so vibrant, and so full of life, but have you noticed over the course of the nine months that you've been working I can't do math, whatever from March <laughs> till now. Um, yeah. Have you noticed that the palette changing um, darker, lighter in any way in response to the circumstances around you right now? I mean, I know you're in isolation. I know uh, you, you love 
it that way. But I'm curious if it's seeping through the cracks at all and influencing your work. I would say no. Okay. Um, But this is the first year that I've suddenly decided to do black paintings. And I did about 45 of them that were black, rust, and then more black. Um, But, you know, people... Some people assume that black means depression, although I was perfectly happy. And what I meant it as was um, a different way to see things, which goes back to your question about what is it like when you can't see the things that you want to see, when you can't travel. There's, um, so those paintings were about how moths might see the world. They see it differently from us. And it was my scientific explanation of what moths see when they look at certain things. (laughs) So all of the different things that go on um, in our lives that we are not seeing directly and we don't see in our full color spectrum. So whether that's magical issues or uh, scientific issues, that's how I express it in black. Well, and I I think you, what a fabulous question too, Monique, because looking at what we've all experienced through this, through the pandemic has been an uh, an epic shift for everyone in the way that their normal life comes up. So I think, you know, it's almost like a subtopic of the, of the podcast right now is just the pandemic itself. That's changed if people are able to go to their studios or if they're working more from home. I've seen, you know, an influx of videos from artists online that's, you know, look, I'm painting on my, you know, uh, kitchen countertop nowadays because I don't have access to the way that I used to create. And, And the thing that I feel like has been a consistency within all of this is the shifting and continuing to make and continuing to do things no matter what comes up that uh, the whatever challenges have actually been opportunities in some way to look at things a little differently or to produce artwork a little differently uh but that's i think for us who also are able to still kind of have that ability to do that you know which kind of leads me into this next idea of privilege you know, that um, that because we have the ability to spend our time making work, what are your thoughts about this idea around the privilege of being able to be an artist, Monique? Does that resonate at all? I mean, I would say absolutely. Um, I think it's a it's a total gift. And to be able to, again, we're going back to the pandemic because uh, it is what we're experiencing right now, to be able to process that through a creative lens, whether that's through painting or drawing or music, um, I think it it makes what's ineffable about this experience uh, digestible for me personally, but also for you know my community. Um, and I, I I really don't love art as therapy. Um, a lot of people say that, oh, it must be so therapeutic to be able to paint in your studio. And you're like, it's really hard fucking work. Um, But it is nice. It is really nice to process this experience through art, um, whether that's through dog paintings, doodles, or, you know, photorealistic portraits. It's, I think, I think it's a privilege. I think it's a gift. One place I was going with the idea of privilege too is like, is it a luxury art you know like i know a lot of people look at this process and the idea of this like romanticized um starving artist type of paradigm and there are a lot of people whose art making process uh you know has to come secondary to them you know putting a roof over their head and feeding themselves and their family i think it i think it depends though on what you're actually considering art and Mm -hmm. the level of function of that person. So for example, let's say that you do have a job that requires you to be in an office or some other place other than your creative space many hours of the day. And when you come home, you don't want to do a traditional art form, like suddenly start painting some 
fantastic series of something. There are other things that could happen. You could prepare your evening meal in an extremely beautiful centered, balanced, artistic way. Maybe you have vegetable pilas that make flower shapes out of your carrots. So that would, to me is art. And that to me is the art that informs later when you do have the ability to dedicate your time and resources to creating a secondary or a continuation of the form that can be music, it can be painting, it can be sculpture, it can be climbing a mountain perfectly, it can be doing skateboarding and, you know, whatever it is, the point is that one informs the other as long as we don't make a separation between art and life. And I think that that is a compulsion, perhaps, to people who do not practice every day. They think that there's a myth of genius. There's a myth of inspiration that um, everything you put down will be fabulous. Everything is going to be easy. It's this fantasy of I just go in there and twirl around and suddenly these fabulous paintings pop out. There is hard work. There is lots of editing. There's lots of revising and redoing. And all of that, all of the... All of that plus all of the waiting until you have the opportunity to do it while you're working at a job you don't like, that all plays into the eventual product. I think you hit on some really interesting things there, especially this idea of other things in your life can be almost practice for when you're, uh, or, you know, like sketches for those things that come out later. Um, I absolutely love how you were mentioning that this idea of mindful, like even food preparation becomes this idea of a sketch in life for your art practice at another time. And that's a really good reminder, I think, for anybody who's out there who's struggling to make that time, to make that space for whatever um, they consider their artistic practice or whatever they've decided in their mind is the, the evolution of that artistic practice or how it needs to show up. I think thinking about things in artistic terms, the way you kind of look at the world becomes kind of that ongoing practice for what you end up manifestation, manifesting into an object. Uh, Monique, were there times in early on in your career where you were struggling with that balance between um, the ideas of work and art making? You know, I didn't struggle with it um, per se. I I worked for eight years. I was a sales manager for a company that manufactured audio connectors. So on like a sexy level, I was in the rock and roll industry, but like on the least sexy part <laughs> of the industry. Um, and during the days, I I sold that product and I sold it well. And then at night, I would paint till two, three in the morning. And I grew up in a military family, so we worked really hard. Like that strong work ethic was so important to us. So I never, I never felt sorry for myself. I felt super blessed, frankly, um, and really fortunate that I was able to, to do both. Um, I could afford a studio, I could afford overpriced sweaters from anthropology, and I could still make art and have museum shows. And finally, it got to the point where my art, uh, was selling well enough that I was able to quit that job. So it, it all worked out well in the end. Um, but it, it took time. I, I thought it was a great experience. I have no, no regrets at all. Well, and I suspect that one was kind of informing the other again. And that's where I feel like at a certain point, we all almost have, I don't know if it's a conscious decision or not, that our lives are just this idea of being an artist. You know, it's not separating them in some way. And uh, so we're going to head into a break here. Welcome back, first of all. And one of the things that I think we're constantly struggling with just in life in general is how we make room for the things that we really need to make room for. 
Uh, Kuzana, what challenges have you had in making room for your creative life? Uh, well, I used to, we used to live in South Korea and teach at a university. So we lived, first of all, in very tiny spaces, and secondly, spent all of our time teaching. So um, basically, what I did was find art forms that were not paint, that could be stored in small spaces, that could be worked on during minutes at a time, as opposed to requiring hours of solitude and complicated materials, things that were not available in Korea necessarily. So using whatever is at hand to produce something, some sort of satisfying expression of whatever. What were some of those things that you created? Oh, well, um, I learned how to do a type of quilting called sashiko, which is just a running stitch. And it's uh, an art form that was developed in Japan many years ago. But it has to do with mending. It also has to do with describing um, names and things in stitch. So that was one. Um, various things to do with paper, like origami or paper cutting also. And I loved going for walks and just looking at stuff. The looking at stuff is kind of like making sketches that never become boring because they're never put in a sketchbook and allowed to die in there. They can constantly be reinvented. I love that because I feel like for myself personally, that I am constantly looking around at the world around me and noticing pattern and color and the way things connect. And I don't know if that's because of the formal training that I've had or because I look at artwork all day long or if that's just uh, some way in which came to be. You know, and that's where it's, I think, often hard for us to distinguish, you know, where the artist ends and where you know, the rest of our life begins. And I, I, and I, the more that we're talking here, I think it seems universal between all of us that those lines aren't blurred. There just isn't a line. That is just exactly. kind of the way that we show up. Uh, Monique, do you feel like you were mentioning earlier that you've had a lot of support from community and family and friends. Um, do you feel that they've really... You know, can you give some examples of how they've kind of accepted and supported you in your art making life? You know, I came from, although a military family, a very creative family. Um, my grandfather was a press photographer during the Kennedy administration. And so my entire family really respected um, not only just the art of photography, but art in general. And so growing up, I was surprised that, you know, Major Richard Krein, my father, uh, it was extremely encouraging of me pursuing an art practice uh, as my career. Well, and Kuzana, how have you seen your family, your community show up uh, in support of your art practice? Doug, I have not. <laughs> so this, this, I think, cannot be a question for me. Okay. Um, but but I, w I will answer something which is not exactly what you're asking. Sure. Um, which is that, and I don't know how to say this so that it doesn't sound spooky, but I often feel visited by various family members while I'm working, not in real life, obviously. I mean... On a spiritual way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, because I said that I am in isolation all the time, I am lonely for my family. They also, many of them live overseas. Many of them have already died because... They're very old, and I'm also older. So that's how they support me, and that is like a big, super big support because it's a um, font of interesting things, interesting to me, things to paint about, right? Like I'm not just painting about my childhood. I'm talking about great-grandmother and her um, tandem bicycle and how she rode it all over Bombay. 
<laughs> that kind of thing. I just had a vis beautiful visual from that too. Yeah, they had Victorian clothes and she and her husband wore complete suits to get on this bicycle and go riding about. Okay, I need to see that painting. <laughs> I'd like to ask Monique about um, how does teaching affect whatever it is that you do? I've also been a teacher. Do you feel like it? you're teaching painting, I assume? or I am, yeah. So wh what do you think? Like, are you learning from the students? Are you getting whatever it is that you're putting in return to you? I, that's, I think that's a really great question. I think teaching is, it's just such a generous task, right? You give so much of yourself and so much of, of your knowledge and your skills and your spirit um, to these students in the hopes that they learn something and they do well. I mean, I personally get so much out of it. I, I've actually recently been in touch with a student um, from Harvard and she was my student, what, three years ago? And she's working on a new project. And just the fact that she felt compelled and comfortable to reach out to me and ask for help was like the most gratifying uh, feeling in the world. So I'm like, oh, I am valuable. Oh, so much cares. <laughs> um, because it is a kind of a humbling thing too. You know, you, you hope you're doing well and you hope you're making an impact. And in terms of my own practice, it, it makes me want to do my best also as an artist. Um, it sounds like you both have really been able to integrate, you know, a really healthy balance with your art work life where it doesn't even have that separation anymore. Is there uh, some advice that you can give uh, to somebody who's maybe just starting out and really struggling with that, you know, with that work life balance? My advice would be to really enjoy the minute that you're in right now. And if there's an urge to express it, then find a way to do it that's authentic to you, whether it's taking photographs and putting them on Instagram, or if it's taking photographs and never showing them to anybody, as long as it is, it is authentic and feels right to you, that's what's most important. It doesn't matter if it's a painting on a gallery wrapped canvas, or if it is a, uh, something that you're going to show somebody else. The impetus to create is something that should be respected and nourished by you in order to achieve something now or later. See, that's so beautiful. I wish I could say something like that. But when I was applying to graduate schools, I received some of the, the best advice. Uh, she said, well, ultimately, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to I want to teach and I want to paint. And she says, OK, well. I'm, I'm doing just that. Like I, I have your dream job, but I am also sitting here, um, in, you know, used clothing that I got from like the local thrift store. Yeah. I think I look good, but she's like on a teacher salary and making art, you're not going to make a ton of money. So don't go into a ton of debt to get there. Um, cause the programs I had been accepted to, uh, only one provided a full scholarship. Otherwise I would have been upwards of a hundred thousand dollars in debt at least. Um, and the practical side of paying that off is just not very realistic within most artists salary, um, if they have a yeah. salary at all. And so I ultimately went to, I went to Cornell and they gave me a full ride, but to have to pay a hundred thousand dollars off in the course of my lifetime would be nearly impossible and would limit me from eventually, you know, buying a house and all these other things, you know, taking vacations, etc. because I'd have a $1,000 a month, I'd have to pay off. So that is really practical advice, but something that I'm so grateful for now, because I don't have that student debt. I find it very interesting about the debt issue, because I did graduate with um, a huge debt for art school. And of course, you know, when we talk about going to art school, the first reaction people say is, well, what is the point? You know, you're just not going to be making money and you're just having four years of playing around in the studio. However, that debt led us to South Korea to pay off the debt. And we had many experiences there that 
we wouldn't have had had we not been required to pay off this debt. Um, also, if there is no other way to go to school, it sharpens your motivation for going to school. And for me, I wasn't going to school to learn how to be a painter. I didn't even use paint in school. What I was going was to see that there were other painters on this planet who have been able to um, grow, thrive, produce their work, and be superstars. So two of my most favorite professors were exactly that. And for me, as a young person, to see the exact opposite of what I grew up hearing was going to happen to an artist was wonderful and was worth every penny that I could learn that lesson immediately and I could live it and learn it as opposed to just hearing somebody say, oh, no, it isn't like that or it is like that. Right. Um, so I'm not even sure if debt is a problem. I, I think that's beautiful that you had that experience. You know, I had a professor uh, who... Um, you know, really kind of reiterated that idea that like inspiration is for an amateurs and that just show up to your studio, start sharpening some pencils, just be in that space, whatever happens. And then that'll start emerging and start working. And I think sometimes it's just this idea of putting yourself in that mindset that I can, uh, you know, that I can make a little bit of space for this. Um, could you guys talk to me a little bit about like your schedules with that? Do you guys uh, paint every day? Are you able to make room for that? I do. I, I paint around 10 hours a day and um, don't really do anything else because I don't want to. And it has nothing to do with my studio. So that's what I like doing. And that's what I spend my time doing. And then once every three months when the paintings are finished and I'm waiting for them to dry enough that they can be sent away, that's when I do everything else in that one week span. So I apply to all of the shows that I want to be in. I apply to the residencies that I want to attend. I write letters. I try to remind all my friends I'm still here, even though I've not talked to them for three months. And that's, I like it like that. And Monique, did you typically have a schedule as far as how you would fit in your art practice? You know, in, in my pre-kids past life, um, similarly, it was, you know, the studio 10 to 14 hours a day at least. Um, and it was, God, it was fabulous. Pre-pandemic, it was when the kids were in daycare and at night when they were asleep. And, and now it's whenever I can squeeze it in. But again. I, I don't see that separation between art and life and find creative outlets, whether it's coloring in my son's coloring book or, you know, making a beautiful meal. Uh, there's always room for that creative process. So it's, it's a little bit more of an adjustment. <laughs> <laughs> and I think also appreciating beauty and appreciating life and not saying, well, I'll do such and such thing later once I have more time, once I have the perfect situation, once I have my new sketchbook, once I have the right markers and I have the right color and I'm not tired, I'm not this. If it doesn't feel right, you don't have to do it. Yeah. You can just relax and enjoy whatever it is that you're doing at this moment. It will provide you with everything you need for every subsequent moment. You know, one of my goals, uh, you know, with having uh, this as a platform is to also let artists know that there is absolutely a way for them to make a living doing this. You know, artists can thrive and they can succeed uh, no matter what those challenges are in their their careers, uh, be it from family to debt to whatever might arise. Uh, you can thrive and you can succeed as an artist and there's no right way of doing it um, except for what ends up working out for you. Um, so Monique, Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And Kuzana, um, 
I'm so grateful that you joined us, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing what emerges from both of your studios. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely talking to you both. You too. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Artbound podcast. For more information about the guests and what we've discussed, go to artistnetwork.com slash artbound. You can also find ways to connect with me and the Artbound team. We'd love to hear from you. If you've enjoyed the show, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen. Artbound is an artist network podcast and produced by Golden Peak Media. It's hosted by me, Doug Casina. Our producer is Daisha Clay with audio.